Well, hey everyone, and welcome to our online experience. No matter what platform you are joining us on or listening from, it's such an honor that you decided to spend the next hour with us today. Here at Central, our vision is to help you connect with God and with one another. Everything that we do revolves around those two things. One easy way to partner with us to help others get connected is by taking a moment to share this experience on whatever platform you're joining us on. Perhaps you can write a review or leave a rating as it goes a long way in spreading the word about this amazing community of faith. Also, if you'd like to worship through your giving and partner with us in this vision of helping others get connected, you can do that by heading over to our website at centralcc.ca forward slash give. You can follow the prompts, schedule a one-time gift, or set up regular ongoing giving. Thank you for believing in this vision and for being faithful in this way. Now, today I want to take a moment to let you know a few ways you can get connected here at Central. Our chosen method of connection with others is groups. And we have four kinds of groups here at Central. Community groups, small groups, interest groups, and support groups. If you need help finding a group that fits your needs, simply head over to our website, centralcc.ca forward slash groups and search the many groups that are available there to find the best one that fits you. We have had a great first week of our 21 Days of Prayer community group. There's still time to join us if you haven't had the opportunity. We are back tomorrow and invite you to join us from 6 to 7 a.m., Monday to Friday, and 9 to 10 a.m. on Saturdays as we continue our year in prayer and personal connection with God. As a reminder, we know for some of you making it out out of the house for 6 a.m. is sometimes difficult, you know, with small kids at home or early work schedules. So we are making it easier for you uh, and everyone else that would like to join us by offering both an in-person and an online option. More details on how to join us are available at our website, centralcc.ca forward slash 21 days. If you're looking for a way to connect on a Sunday and are watching during our broadcast time of 10.30 a.m., we want to invite you to join us via Zoom for Encore, an after-service conversation. This is an opportunity for you to ask questions and continue the conversation around the morning message. It's a safe place to connect and ask questions and meet others. Hey, I'll be there with a team of others. So why don't you head over to centralcc.ca forward slash connect and you will find a link there so you can join us. We also have a number of groups that are gearing up to start at the end of January. And so throughout this month, we want to encourage you to check out the many opportunities available to get connected through groups. Everything you need to know and how to register can be found at centralcc.ca forward slash groups. One group we want to highlight is Alpha. If you're new to faith or would like a safe place to ask questions about who Jesus is and why he is worth following, you can join us on February 6th at 1030 right here at Central for this eight-week group. Alpha is a group that over 24 million people have gone through around the world, and we'd love for you to join us. So if you'd like more information on that group, head over to centralcc.ca forward slash groups. Again, if you have any questions or would like to pre-register your family to join us in person on Sundays, head over to our website or text the word CENTRAL to 905-937-5610. So that's all for me. We are excited you have joined us today. Our experience is about to begin and it all starts right now.
you, Jesus, for everything you've done. From the very beginning of my days when I called out to you, you were there. And I remember those times. And now when I need you most, when I call out to you, you are still here for me and with me, God. So God, we worship you.
comforted to know that. That's why I'm smiling right now as I sing that. Even when I can't see it and it seems so hard, you are here. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that when we cry out to you and we call out to you, you are with us. And you heal and you mend and you help and you bring light, you comfort. Thank you, Jesus. I want to encourage you to remind yourself today of what God has done for you. And that perspective change of reminding yourself and being grateful for who our God is and for who He has been to you can change your perspective, like I said, but can change your life. Reminding ourselves that God is who He says He is, is powerful and we need to believe it. So God, we believe in you today, bigger and better than everything we face. You're the one we trust or put all of our hope in. We need you more than ever, God. So we thank you for who you are. Powerful God, come now. Um, small and growing and we've got a mix of men and women and all different walks careers and it's really good because what some of the feedback that I've received have been this has been my lifeline through the pandemic I haven't got out to church much I haven't connected with other believers in a meaningful way and this group here is my lifeline. I was really hoping to find friends in my age group and like in going in the same journey as me because I just wanted more friends in that area. And we were all supposed to go out for dinner that night too. So it was really like scary, like who are we sitting with? Because you can only sit to certain many people at a table. And from that night, we were, I think only six people went out for dinner in total. Out of the whole 30 people that went and that six of us, to this day, we've grown to be 30 people that go out for dinner now in that whole year. You know, something I heard recently is that if you're faithful, God will make you fruitful. And I'm really seeing that play out in this group. That to be a part of a group is so important because when you go to a group, you can be close with them, you can share with them, you can support to each other, and, and you can find support. God has created us to be together and without that connection, without walking alongside other people, I think it's really difficult to be supported. Um, life's tough. And if you don't have people walking alongside you through the journey sometimes, it would be such a lonely place. And, and God has created us and created other people in our lives for that purpose, to be family um, where you don't have family. One of the most special or meaningful thing is knowing people which have become family for me in this new country and this new culture. For someone who's never been to a group, because I was in the same place a year ago, 
um, just give it a shot. Um, do your research, like think about it. With the thing with young adults is it's really nice because it's not a specific interest. It's not a specific like group that they're doing something and it's not like we go at a certain time of year. It's just a community group. We're all in the same age. We're all going through the same path and it's all a starting point for you to Find your direction and find an interest group and find what works for you. For new people coming to Canada, a group would help them. When we are in a new country, in a new culture, you don't know anybody and that's so hard. But when you go to a group, you can connect with other people. And as I said before, that people will become family for you. I think everybody should get in them. <laughs> I don't ever want anybody to walk away feeling, I don't belong, I don't fit in, and I'm alone. And it's so nice when you do come together in the larger settings to make eye contact with somebody or to be able to reach out to somebody and go, hey, I know you and you know me and have that connection in the bigger group because you've built that intimate relationship in a small group. There is something for everyone, but talk to people. Find out how and who to make the connections with. What would you do if you had absolutely no fear? I mean, really, just think about it for a second. What would you do if you had no fear? As I look at my life, to be honest with you, some of my greatest regrets are the fact that I was too afraid to try something or do something I knew I needed to do. And on the flip side, some of my biggest mistakes were because I let fear set the tone. I let fear direct the narrative. So we want to be free from fear in 2022 in this series entitled Freedom. And last week, we started by identifying or defining freedom this way. Freedom is the ability to do what is best. This is going to require wisdom to know what that is and the courage to do it no matter what the cost. Okay, so we're in the story of Exodus, right? And here's the story. Moses, burning bush experience last week. God says, go help my people find freedom. He goes to Pharaoh and through an incredible series of events, which you can read for yourself. And I want to encourage you to come to our 21 days of prayer because we're exploring this every day. But through a series of incredible events, they find their freedom, sort of. <laughs> so here's what happens. They get out of Egypt and there are thousands, literally maybe even hundreds of thousands of them, and they are traveling. And as they travel, they come to this obstacle called the Red Sea or the Dead Sea. Now, meanwhile, Pharaoh goes, wait a minute, what did we just do? We just let our workforce go. We won't get anything done. So he changes his mind. So he pursues the Israelites and they are caught, literally not between a rock and a hard place, but between Pharaoh's army, who's going to kill them, and a sea that they cannot cross. What do you do then when there seems to be literally no options? Well, let's read. It says in Exodus chapter 14, verse 12, that the Israelites say to Moses, and they're a bit justified, okay? They said, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? That's what fear does, right? Like, God, oh, it would have been better off without this bondage, this pain. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And I guess... To some degree, they're right, right? I mean, live or die. So, so why do they say this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is that they have misplaced hope. Here's what I mean by that. They're putting their hope, all of their hope, in surviving. They think that is life. If the goal of life is surviving, they are right. But it's more than that. God doesn't want them just to survive. He wants them, pardon the cliche, to thrive. He really does. He has something even better. But they also are stuck in this really hard place. It's an obstacle. And they only see two options, servitude or death. They never see, and I think many of us fall into the same category. They don't see the third option. What if God actually keeps his promise, true to his character, and saves them? 
So here's what happens. They let fear, right? Fear write the narrative. And when fear writes the narrative, you always lose. Now, I gotta be careful here because I wanna define fear. Because there is a healthy fear. And I, and I know right now, maybe you've been accused of having too much fear over the situation we're in that I will not name. Uh, or maybe you've used fear tactics, right? On your own or, or other people, whatever that is. So there is a good fear. So I looked up in the definition, in the dictionary, it says fear is the unpleasant emotion caused by the threat of danger, pain, or harm. So here's what happens. When fear kicks in, your body actually starts to take over. Adrenaline starts coursing through your body. Your, your, your blood vessels actually open, blood flow and oxygen become to become increased. Your focus, you actually become more alert. And this is actually a God-given gift. Because if there's a legitimate threat and you won't need that adrenaline to run away, that's a very, very good thing, especially in the face of an enemy. So I'm not talking about that kind of fear. But the kind of fear I'm talking about, and here's my definition of what I wanna talk about today, is the perception of a threat, real or not, that leads to irrational behavior because it makes one feel hopeless. Oh man, <laughs> have I been there where I just feel completely hopeless, like out of options, no solutions. All I can see is an enemy on this side and an obstacle behind me. I am stuck. And in that fear, literally takes over and creates a narrative. I will never be free, right? So when you believe you can't escape the threat, then you become a slave to your fear. Or fear can make you more vulnerable to control. Remember when you were a kid and your parents told you those horrific bedtime stories that were like traumatizing, like Hansel and Gretel getting eaten, for example, <laughs> or Little Red Riding Hood's grandma getting destroyed by a wolf and the wolf wearing her clothes? Weird. But we told those stories, right? <laughs> Hopefully to scare our kids into good behavior. I don't know if it worked, parents. It just scared your kids. But right, it's a, it's a mechanism for control. But fear can also cripple you from rational decision-making. It's called the amygdala, right? It's your fear, your flight, or your fright, right? You, you either run, you either panic, or you freeze. It's, it's an irrational response. It actually cripples you. And as a matter of fact, I came across this really interesting study from the University of Minnesota talking about the long-term impacts of fear. And many of you know this, right? So fear robs you of sleep, which actually is really harmful for you. Fear can cause heart conditions, stomach ailments, fear can cripple the way you think, your hearts, your bowels, your even fertility can be impacted by fear. They also discovered that it impacts your brain. So there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus where memories are stored and fear can actually distort your memories. You don't even remember properly and it actually limits it. It's like a dam. It keeps things from flowing properly, the truth to actually break through and because it sits in the amygdala, the base of your brain, it never actually gets to the frontal cortex, which is the rational, logical part of your brain. So, <laughs> if it's so damaging, which I believe it really is, and the Bible teaches that, right? How many times does the Bible say, do not be afraid? How can you identify it? How do you know if it's in your life? Because here's the deal. For some of us, fear has become such a part of our life and such a part of our narrative, we don't even recognize it or identify it anymore. So let me give you four really quick ways that maybe you can identify fear in your life or in someone else's life. Maybe today is about finding their freedom. So I'm gonna use the acronym FEAR, F-E-A-R, and maybe you, you heard it as false evidence appearing real, which is partly true, but I wanna add something to that. So the F for me stands for a false narrative. It's not rooted in what is really true. Hitler said it this way, tell a lie loud enough and long enough and people will believe it. I don't know if you remember in the 80s, if you're, sorry if you're younger than that, I'm an old guy now, but in the 80s, everyone was a terrified of power lines. Remember power lines? They said caused cancer. And so no one wanted to buy a house under power lines. Farmers were like actually protesting because their power lines going through their fields and they all thought we were gonna die of cancer. Well, a study in 2018 proved that false Actually false, okay? Uh, the electric, electronic magnetic field does not impact you. It doesn't. They had 11 worldwide studies and proved that false. But even to this day, there are people I talk to like, oh, I don't want a house under the power lines, right? Well, they look ugly. But besides that, it doesn't cause cancer. 
So sometimes you've created a false narrative and you've told it yourself so many times and the people around you believe it and you believe it too. Another way is an exaggerated perspective. That's the E, exaggerated perspective, which means you make it bigger than it is. So I'm gonna teach you a new word. I, I just learned it this week. It's pretty cool. It's called poten uh, potentiation. <laughs> and here's what happens with potentiation. Your brain creates a neural pathway. So anytime you have an experience, your brain makes a connection. So you remember. The reason for that is so that you don't do it again if it was a really bad idea, and you do it again if it's a really good idea. So when you eat chocolate and your brain goes, whoa, -hoo -hoo, right, do that again. When you eat something you hate, don't ever do that again. That's the neural pathway. But they're learning that you can actually force a neural pathway that isn't actually real. So let me give you an example. Let's say you had, uh, you have a phobia of spiders and you've just watched a documentary on spiders and it creeps you out. And in your mind, you said, man, if that ever happened to me, like if a spider ever landed on me, I would lose my mind. You go to bed, right? A little feather from your pillow pokes out and starts tickling you on the back of the neck. Your brain goes, you're getting attacked by a spider, right? And you freak out. <laughs> Only hopefully to laugh after when you realize it was just a feather. That's a, that is a potentiation. Or if you had a frightful experience with a dog as a child, you're terrified of dogs. It's not true, you've exaggerated it. Yes, you should be, obviously, spiders are kind of gross. And yes, dogs can be dangerous, but you've exaggerated it beyond its truth. Um, in The Princess Bride, uh, one of the cool parts is when they're about to go through the fire swamp and the princess says to the prince, uh, we're gonna die. Like, we're gonna, we can't go in there. Like, that's, that, that's, no one ever escapes. And he says to her in return, you're just saying that, because no one ever has, right? So it's the thing in our life that we've exaggerated. The, the, the third is A is anxiety. Um, and I think this is a big one. And, and I wanted to define anxiety. The definition in the, in the dictionary is to worry about something that has an uncertain outcome. But I wanna add a level to that because I think a lot of us actually create a future that may or may not even come to be or come to pass. You've done this, right? Someone's gonna make a decision and you're like, oh no, if you do that, then this, then this, and this. You've got them in the hospital. You've got, you've got all the worst thing. They're gonna be broke. You've already created a false narrative. Like your kid comes home and you caught them smoking and like you're thinking they're gonna become a drug addict living under a bridge, right? That's, that's what happens. We have anxiety. We create a future. And the problem with that is that we then plant seeds and those seeds if unattended, will grow into something that becomes uncontrollable. Epictetus, we talked about him last week, the Stoic philosopher said, man is not worried by real problems so much as by his imagined anxieties about real problems. So the problem with this is that we can make definitive statements without any basis in truth or certainty. Like you're gonna get sick, you're gonna die. Um, you always do this. You never do that. These uns we, we speak certainty into uncertainty and we create a monster. That's anxiety. The R, a part of this is really bad alliteration, <laughs> but wrong. I know it starts with a W. I know that, okay, everyone, don't, don't send me emails. Wrong focus. Another reason for fear is that we get distracted by the wrong thing, like when you're walking a tightrope, right? They say, don't look down, look ahead. Because if you look down, you will fall. It's the same. When you are looking at the wrong things. So in this story, right? Let's go back to the story. What's happened? Well, the Israelites are living in fear. They're, they're terrified. And we, there's a part of it that's justified, but there's a part that isn't. Um, because again, they've created a false narrative. We're gonna die. Well, we know the story. That's not true. Um, they have an exaggerated perspective. They've made it bigger than it is. They're like, like, this is impossible, right? They have a lot of anxiety. They've already determined what's gonna happen. And... They have a wrong focus. They're focusing on the army um, and the Egyptians. And here's the problem. They have been slaves for so long that they actually believe the Egyptians are greater than the God who is going to deliver them. Whew, time out. Okay, like really, how many times do we make our situation bigger than the God who is above and greater than every situation? That simply is fear. And we cannot tolerate it in our life. So how did Moses respond? Well, in verse 13, Moses answered, do not be afraid. <laughs> now you're like, now if you're those people, you're like, that's easy for you to say. Actually, no, because he's gonna die too, if it's true. 
Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Could you imagine if you could speak that into your fear today? Could you imagine if you could speak that into your home? The fear that you have today, you will never see again. That is powerful. And the Lord will fight for you. So what should you do? You need to be still. What, just stand here? No, the word still in the Hebrew doesn't mean a cessation of activity. That's a part of it. But what that word literally means in the original language is to stop making noise. (laughs) And actually, the Hebrew word is to dig in, like to engrave or to plow in a field. It means dig into what is true. Stop making noise and trust, dig in to who God is. Lean into God's love. Stop trying to control the narrative and let the one who is above the narrative and writes every narrative, let him speak love and victory and freedom into your life. So, is there a way out of of fear into freedom? I do believe there is. And I think it's found in harnessing it because there's a positive part and a negative part. It's kind of like electricity. Yeah, like electricity, if you're struck by lightning, not so good. Um, But if you can harness electricity, it can do a lot of good. It can be powerful. So how have I learned? (laughs) Through this story and in my own experience and through reading scripture, how have I learned to harness my fear? Well, for me personally, whenever I'm afraid of something, I have to ask this really important question, is it true? So I'm afraid to fail a lot. I'll I'll be honest with you. That's one of my biggest failures and our fears that I'm gonna fail. And, and I have to actually sometimes step back and go, is that true? Like, like I, sometimes before I speak, it's like, I have nothing to say. Well, that, that's not true. Or I can't do this. That's not true. Um, or no one's gonna receive, that's not true. So I have to get back to what is true. And here's the deal what I've learned is sometimes I can't find my way, right? I mean, it's like a fog. It's like all I see is ocean and Egyptian army. I can't see it. So this is where this for me is key because I need some mooring, some anchoring back to what is really true. And so when I forget, I need to be reminded, who does God say I am? What does God say is possible? Who is God and what can he do? And so I, the reason I read the Bible is because I need to know that. And that's why I want you to read Exodus, if you can, every week. Yeah, all 40 chapters every week for three weeks, because something will happen inside of you. Speak that truth into your life. So I also need to surround myself with others. This is why groups is so important. Because I need a good buddy to come along and say, Bill, like, smarten up. That isn't true. I need them to remind me, you're not a failure, Bill. I, lo- I love you. I believe in you. Even if you don't believe it yet, I'm going to believe that for you. Or sometimes I just need it in, as I reflect on my own experience. Like, God hasn't failed me. And I need to be reminded of that. So you, maybe the question you need to ask into your fear is, what is really true? And if you, you need help, we're here for you. That's the church. That's why we're doing 21 days of prayer. That's why we're doing Sundays. That's why we gather. It's why we do groups. The second question you need to ask is, why do I believe this lie? And, and I think it's because a lot of our fear is rooted in some traumatic experience in the past. Um, and it can, be, it can be a traumatic experience. It can be a generational lie. Like, Maybe your family, has, all they talk about is how we're always going to be broke, right? Well, guess what? If you believe that lie, yes, that's exactly, because you'll act in a way that broke people act, and you'll never be free. Um, or you, you had something happen to you, some bad experience, and you think, oh, that's going to, some, something traumatic happened to a friend of yours, and you think automatically, that's going to happen to me. Or sometimes, and I'm going to be careful here, I'm just going to leave it, I'm going to say it and leave it. Sometimes it's a cultural lie. Um, they actually found in that study in the University of Minnesota, that there can be a thing called mass psychosis, that a whole group of people can actually believe a lie and make it true or feel true. So what do you do with it? You take it out like you take the garbage out. Pastor Mike did this great thing in 21 Days of Prayer this week. He had a garbage bag. He said, what do you do with garbage? You put it in the curb and you leave it there. You don't go rooting through it. You don't drag it back. You leave it there and someone, God, takes it away. So why do you believe the lie? Let God take that away. And then finally, how will I face this? Here's maybe the most powerful thing for me. I have learned that if I'm willing to face my fear, okay, if I'm willing to trust the truth about who God is and who he says I am, and when God asks me to do something, he will give me everything I need to do it when I believe that and I face my fear. Do you know what it is? It's a ticket 
into opportunity. I actually believe fear can be a doorway into something greater. What God is gonna do in this story is he's gonna open the ocean and they're gonna walk through and then that ocean is gonna close on the Egyptians. They are going to find freedom because they choose through the help of Moses to lean into something greater than their circumstance, greater than their fear, the love of God. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. And so here's the deal. I know you're in the middle of the story, but we know the ending. We know that God ultimately is going to win. And for those of us who believe that, that gives us incredible courage. So when fear says, what if, faith says, even if. Even if this happens, I'm gonna believe God is good. And so I don't have time, but you can read the rest of the story in Exodus 14, verses 21 to 28. I already told you what happens. The ocean parts. A a way is made where it seems to be impossible. And the the fear of the enemy, the thing they were afraid of, is consumed by that uh, water. And so today I want for you the freedom. Freedom is that ability to do what is best. And that happens when you believe the truth and not the lies. What lie do you need to break? What would you do today if you had absolutely no fear? Why not do it? And that's gonna take wisdom and it's gonna take courage, but you can do it. The greatest way to destroy fear in your life is by putting in a, your faith in a God who is true, who loves you and is fighting for your freedom. And with that, I bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And today, we'd love to challenge you to consider what is your next step. Maybe you realize you'd like to take a next step in following in the ways of Jesus. We realize that everyone is at a different spot on their journey of faith. And as a church, our mission is really simply just to get you connected to God and each other. So if you made a decision to begin following in the ways of Jesus, or would like more information on what that looks like, simply text the word CENTRAL to 905-937-5610, or head over to our Connect page at centralcc.ca forward slash connect for your next step. Or maybe you'd like to get connected in a group and explore your faith with others. The best way to do that is by simply heading over to our groups page at centralcc.ca forward slash groups and find a group that best fits you. If you're joining us at the 1030 experience, why not click the link in the chat area now and join us for Encore, an after service conversation. This is a great opportunity to ask questions, talk about the discussion questions, or just talk about today's message with some of our leaders. Hey, I'll be there. If you have any questions on how to get connected, simply head over to our website, centralcc.ca, or text the word CENTRAL to 905-937-5610, and you will find everything you need there on how to get connected. Well, that's all for me. Hope you have an amazing week, and we hope to see you back here next time.